Her column is syndicated to over 300 newspapers. She's a three-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, and she happens to have an opinion on just about everything. Hi, I'm Ernie Manus. Up next on Interviews, my conversation with Molly Ivins. I guess the first place to start is, what's a nice lady like you doing in politics? <laughs> um, I've been covering politics for about 35 years now, and uh, I have so much fun, I really should be arrested. <laughs> where, where did the desire come from? Where was the passion? The first time I ever set foot on the floor of the Texas House of Representatives, I knew that this was reporter heaven. It was the beginning of a session, first day. and. Um, People were slapping each other on the backs and slapping each other on the behinds and whispering. It's like first day of school. And I heard one old boy say to the other, Hey, son, you should see what I found myself last night. And she don't talk, neither. Uh, uh, uh. And I'm going, <laughs> Oh, this could be really interesting. And it has been. What a run. Covering Texas politics, how does that compare to covering government in general? Well, in theory, it's the same. It's just, of course, that the great state has this extra hitch in its get-along that makes it just more surreal and bizarre and fabulous by the moment. There's this quality about our politics as there is about the entire state. It's this sort of slightly lunatic sense of exaggeration, of being bigger than life in a, in a pie-eyed way. Yeah. And that just makes it enormous amount of, amounts of fun. When did you realize that Texas was going to be playing such a major part in the nation? Well, I sometimes think, you know, there's a country song, uh, Lubbock on Everything. And it sometimes seems to me that what we have now is Texas on Everything. Um, it's as though we had imported that whole style of governance and thinking about governance to the rest of the country. I do not know why the other 49 have not seceded by now. <laughs> Take me back a little bit in time about writing. When you first started writing, what was it you were trying to do with your pieces? Well, um, assuming now that we were after I was already a journalist, I had an extraordinary opportunity fairly early in my career. I was co-editor of the Texas Observer, which is a small progressive publication. And what that gave me was the freedom to make my own mistakes, which is an absolutely a priceless gift. And, what, and I made them. Boy, believe me, I did. What I was trying to do was to share with my readers, all of whom were politically aware and sophisticated, or they wouldn't have been reading the magazine in the first place, how absolutely phenomenal it was. And there were no bars on me. I mean, it wasn't as though I were writing for the Associated Press or an establishment newspaper where the stories almost always begin. House Bill 327 was passed at a subcommittee by a unanimous vote on Tuesday. I mean, nobody ever read the second paragraph of that story. And what I got to do was sort of begin by saying, they're screwing you again, you know, or whatever the point really was. And um, it was then I realized that you could write about sports the way sports writers write about, the, uh, write about politics, the way sports writers write about sports. Um, that you didn't have to leave out all the interesting, funny, fascinating, irreverent, insane bits um, because they didn't quite fit the formula. Isn't there, though, supposed to be a certain respect when covering politicians? Oh, absolutely not. Politicians are like in a free fire zone. Um, sometimes I try to remember that they have wives and children, but mostly I figure, nah. Nobody ever held a gun to their heads and forced them to go into politics. And I, the, more, the more skepticism and irreverence we aim at politicians, the better off we are. Believe me, you should never make heroes out of any of them. So there, are, there are great people in politics, and they really are wonderful people, but it's much safer to wait until they're dead. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at the landscape right now, are there any real heroes out there? Oh, yeah, there are always heroes out there. Um, and one of the sad things about our political system is how seldom the really great ones rise to the top. Mm. And luck has an awful lot to do with success in politics, and money has even more. Yeah. When you're writing a column, how much is, or where do you put your emphasis, I guess? Is it on educating your audience, or is it on entertaining them? And how do you make that balance? Well, it's, in theory, it's a little bit like, you know, if, if you can laugh and get them inside the tent, like old-timey preachers tell those terrible jokes. There's nothing worse than preacher humor. 
But they always knew that if you started with a laugh, then you, you could sort of get people's minds cleared of all the cobwebs we all carry around with us and get them to pay attention to what you wanted to say. And then, of course, there are times when it is deadly serious. And I, I rarely write when I'm really angry, uh, but I've done that from time to time, and I think it is called for. It's one of the, one of the weapons you should have in your arsenal. Yeah. What gives you the right to have your opinions so popular? Um, you know, that's interesting. I was a regular reporter for a long time, just out there, one of the pack, taking notes um, and writing fairly boring stories. Um, and I ha was always interested in the process, which is something that gets, it so, sounds like it's sort of inside baseball. But so much of politics is about the rules of the game mm -hmm. and how they're played within, the, how the game is played within those lines. Um, and how come I get to do this and nobody else did? Well, they offered me a column. And traditionally, on newspapers, a political column goes to the most experienced and presumably the best political reporter of his or her generation. So you get Tom Wicker at the Times, people like that. What is happening more and more in the pundit business is that the talking heads you see on television and the people you read on the op-ed pages have never been reporters. Um, they come in straight off the front lines of partisan political warfare. They were speechwriters for a politician. They were, uh, f they were campaign consultants. They were aides to, co aides to congressmen. These are people who come out of the political world and then suddenly come into the media as, you know, people whose opinion, opinions you should pay attention to. And I'm not saying that there is anything wonderful about being a newspaper reporter. I mean, it does not require rocket science. On the other hand, spending several years of your life doing things like covering, uh, interviewing all five eyewitnesses to an automobile accident and then trying to write an accurate account of what happened will give you considerable respect for the complexity of truth. There's an old saying in our business that if you cannot cover a five-car pileup on Route 128, you should not be covering a presidential campaign. And you would be amazed at how many people on the campaign planes these days have never covered a five-car pileup. Is that dangerous then? So many people are taking their information and learning their political lessons from these people. From planes. people with partisan access to grind. Yeah. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> I think it's dangerous. And I, what you often see for balance on television panels is two guys from the right wing and two journalists who are more or less in the middle and they say, okay, it's balanced. Well, that seesaw is not balanced. And if, even if you had two guys from the right wing and two guys from the left wing, all you'd have is two people firing back and forth at one another, nobody with enough experience, objectivity, and it's just a different way of viewing the world to try and give readers and viewers a more rounded impression. Where you get are these gong shows where people, they just fire back at one another. Whoever gets off the cleverest, meanest line is the winner. Yeah. It doesn't help. Um, now, it's not to say that the opposite of gong shows is boring, worthy, sober <laughs> television. Ladies and gentlemen, you won't believe how bad it is today. I mean, good journalism can and should be fun. Right. When you look at the, these shows that are out there and you hear all these people harping and yelling and screaming and how they're getting people upset about the things they're getting them upset about, you have to wonder what happened to all of that liberal media that they're always talking about. It doesn't seem to really exist anymore. Where did it, it go? Is, it is one of the great useful myths of politics. The right wing years ago uh, convinced the public that the media are liberal. And in fact, they're not. Um, they, they're the... Oh, Conrad's has overwhelmingly shifted to the right in all mediums, in media nowadays. Yeah. And, um, but this is still a useful myth, so they like to bring it up and bang on that drum. So you're pretty much a sole voice out there? I, I, it's <laughs> amazingly lonely on the left, an, left, left wing of the op-ed pages these days, I promise you. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in our world. Let's start off with California, the whole recall fiasco. Oh, thank you, California. Had it not been for California, Texas would have been in the news all summer. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I went out to California to cover that race, and, you know, I really am a serious power, uh, policy wonk, and I believe that government is really important and affects pe and shapes people's lives, and I am dedicated to trying to help people understand that this is true, their how much their lives depend on decisions made in the political system. 
So I get out there ready to do my, you know, deep policy analysis and the uh, implications of this guy's stand against this guy's stand, and I just sat there going, Arnold Schwarzenegger looks like a condom stuffed with walnuts. Ray Davis makes Mr. Rogers look as though he was on steroids. I mean, my reaction was just as shallow and vapid <laughs> as that entire <laughs> campaign. I fit right in. Is it a good idea to be able to recall a politician? You know, that was originally part of the great populist uh, emphasis. It comes out, and I myself am, am a left-wing populist, and that's in the old Texas tradition. Um, and initiative referendum and recall were all populist planks to give a greater voice, more direct democracy. And it has been, like almost everything else in politics, corrupted by money. Yeah. So that at this point, it is a function of big money and has nothing to do with democracy. An interesting race, though. Yeah. Does something like that surprise you anymore, that these things happen? No. I, I mean, I'm like everybody else, I like to sit around and pretend that, you know, oh, well, California, they're all so strange out about there, out there. Listen, people from Texas got no business to be talking about a degree of strangeness in politics or anywhere else. Um, but I get concerned about people who are, have become successful in other walks of life and then want to go into politics. And I always think, great, we need all the talent we can get. Plunge right in. But they only want to plunge in at the level of governor or senator. Why is it these guys never want to run for the school board or the county commission where they can learn you know, how it's really played and whether or not they're going to like it? Right. And I think Schwarzenegger in particular is a step beyond, you know, successful in some other venue in life. It's the whole phenomenon of celebrity in our time. And to the extent that infotainment is more and more the marriage of information and entertainment, then the whole phenomenon of celebrity and celebrification, it begins, it begins to make perfect sense. Here's a guy whose only qualification for office is that he had played a robot in movies. Good. Um, but we're used to thinking, you know, he's Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, and so he can transfer that celebrity from one field to another. Yeah. Is that good or bad? Um, I think it's mostly bad. But you'll see, uh, you, you'll see an interesting example of it on the other side. Not that he was a celebrity, but Wesley Clark, the general, who's now running for the Democratic nomination. Here's a guy who's been successful in an entirely different walk of life. And he's going to try and take this into politics at a very high level. And he's already struggling. He's already having trouble because he's never run for office mm -hmm. before. And there really is a, not just politics is sort of in two parts. There's the, the fun, rowdy, raucous game of getting elected. That's the political part of politics. Once you get to office, there's something called governance. And you'll get politicians who are very good at one side and very bad at another. Um, our former Senator Lloyd Benson was a dreadful campaigner. When he stick out his hand, it would be sort of like shaking with a dead fish. And he always sort of rather wished as though you had washed better before you came out to meet him. <laughs> um, but he was fascinated by um, uh, finance at a large level. Um, and he was a very valuable player on the Senate Finance Committee for many years, simply because of that. You get an opposite sort of phenomenon. For example, George W. Bush is really good at the political side of politics, and he's interested in his game, and he loves it, and he's very competitive. He doesn't care at all about governing. He, he, I, he just, he, policy bores him silly. Yeah. What are we going to do? I, I know from your books, your writings, you are probably not a huge fan of the Bush presidency. What are we going to do about it? I mean, what the damage, from your <coughs> point of view, he mm -hmm. can do right now, how can that be undone? Um, every now and again, I look at it, and I'm really taken aback. I think the damage he's already done would take generations to undo. And the mistakes, first of all, there's the finan looming financial disaster, uh, $500 uh, billion dollar deficit. Um, that is simply going to consume what resources are available to do anything useful and good for the people for generations. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one that really concerns me is I think in a couple of, couple of years people are going to look back and say, what was wrong with those fools? They knew about global warming and they did nothing. Yeah. What about when you talk about the deficit? People say, but 
no one could have known 9-11 was going to happen, that, it was, that we were going to have to do something about it. It was going to cost money. It's not his fault that he acted he reacted to a situation. You know, and there were two things. One is that he passed a second tax cut after 9-11, the same kind of tax cut, lopsidedly, going to the rich, overwhelmingly. I mean, and he was just as disingenuous about the tax cuts as he was about the reasons for going to war in Iraq. I mean, he kept saying, and the average American family will get $1,000. Hey, average is a very dangerous figure. What that means is if you average out the enormous tax cuts at the top with, you know, the piddly $50 at the bottom, it winds up an average of $1,000. That doesn't mean that's what most people got. Right. Um, and the second thing you have to remember is when you look at the total deficit, yes, some of it is attributable to increased spending on homeland security, all the additional expenses we had after 9-11, but the bulk of it is directly the result of tax cuts disproportionately skewed to the very people who didn't need them. Could a different person in that position have gotten through this period in our history without causing such a deficit? Oh, absolutely. I'm telling you again that the bulk of the deficit comes from tax cuts heavily skewed toward the wealthy. And the, the extra additional expenses are the small end of that large deficit number. And the reason I ask you that again mm -hmm. is because there are people out there who will say, no, anyone would have us that we've got a great president doing a great job in office. How do you get them to understand this then? Well, um, we try to avoid Chinese, the Chinese water torture effect, drip, drip, drip. <laughs> if I tell you this over and over again, you're going to believe it. Um, it's always hard to get people to listen uh, through, you know, we all sort of like, carry a bunch of luggage around in our brains. It's like the attic. It's old trunks and lamps have been stuck up there. And it takes a lot of effort to sort of move the furniture around uh, and get a different view of things. And I think one of the ways um, you talk to people who made up their minds about Bush, they don't want to hear anything, um, is you have to sort of be able to say to people, this is not about I'm threatening you. One of the things that's happened in political discourse, and you'll see it often, is people who get so angry, their faces get all flushed and the tendons in their neck stand out and their wattle will shake like a turkey gobbler. It's terrifying. Um, I really think we have to become used to the phenomenon of being able to talk politics with people with whom we disagree in a way that is not only civil, uh, but it's actually fun. It's fun to talk politics, to discuss politics with people who don't agree with you. All right. Let me take you a whole different direction for a minute here. There is a pig that was named after you. Yes. <laughs> Why don't you explain One that? One of my greatest honors. I know. I thought that was funny that you consider exactly. it one of your greatest of honors. Of course I do. I was a police reporter in Minneapolis, Minnesota at the beginning of my career. And um, when I left, the guys christened their mascot Pig after me, Molly Pig. It marched for years in the St. Patrick's Day parades up there. <laughs> Why is that something you're proud of? Oh, come on. What better honor could you possibly have, except, of course, the other one I'm terribly <laughs> proud of, which is I was once banned from the campus of Texas A&M. And I want to know why. It's one of those stories where the punchline is better than the story. <laughs> um, A&M used to have a rule, for all I know, they still do, very little changes at the school. Uh, saying that you couldn't have political speakers on campus. And the administration had had both Barry Goldwater and John Tower in to speak that year. Uh, but, said the administration, they didn't give political speeches. So there was a little group of, of kids on campus who wanted to test this rule. And uh, we, went, we wound up uh, having, it, we couldn't have it on campus. We went across the street to the Methodist Student Center where I did my dead level best to incite a riot. I think seven people came out to hear me, and when I was through, they clapped very politely, and we all went out for a beer. <laughs> you have all of these opinions, and you have a great way of sharing them with people. Why don't you run for office? Oh, good heavens. Um, you know, it takes an enormous amount of patience to be in politics. Um, and I'm, I don't think I have it. I really don't. I, I'll tell you where you get it. If you have raised two or more children successfully, um, you will be very good at politics because it's just you understand the degree of patience it takes. And raising kids in politics are actually a lot alike. You know, there's two things that all good moms know. There's what to do when there's one cookie and two kids. 
first kid gets to divide the cookies, second kid gets first choice to eat blue taffy, but all moms know that. <laughs> what to do if there are two kids in the back seat hitting each other, each one of them started it first. You hit me first. I did not. If you are a good driver, you will first pull over the side of the road, but it has been scientifically proven that this is not necessary. Just throw your voice and you say, I don't care who hit who first, you will now stop. <laughs> All political problems, from how to divide the federal budget to how to achieve peace in the Middle East, are just variations. Two kids in one cookie and two kids hitting each other, each one of them claiming the other one started it first. Okay, you have those answers. You know how to handle those ah, two situations, but, so why don't you do it? But living through it. No, it, it does require an enormous amount of patience to be in politics. Yeah. Garrison Keillor observed recently that in politics, uh, when you're running for office, it's great. You get to talk all the time. And then when you win, you have to sit there and listen to a whole bunch of other people who have a, have a hair up their butt. <laughs> Arianna Huffington, a few years ago, wrote a book about overthrowing the government and how people should all get involved in the government. What can we do? What should people be doing to be more involved in their political system? Well, this is something I feel passionately about, and one of the statements that takes me back every time I hear it is, well, there's nothing I can do. Oh, just one person. I have no influence over those people in Washington and those people in Austin. What? There's nothing I can do. You know, just by being a voting American citizen at this point in history, you have more political power than 99% of all the people who have ever lived. Don't throw that away. This country is not run by those people in Washington, and it's not run by those people in Austin. This country is run by all of us. It is our deal. We just hired those people to drive the bus for a while, and we shouldn't ever let them forget it. People will say, but look what happened in Florida at the last presidential election. You know, it didn't matter what the popular vote was. So how does our vote matter? Um, it matters immensely. Now, I'm not saying that the democratic system has not been corrupted. Of course it has been, by the usual suspect, money. I mean, find me anybody in this country, and I don't care where they come from on the political spectrum, who does not understand that the big special interest money influences the way our politicians vote more than we do. But if we stand up and holler, loud enough, when we raise enough hell, as corrupted as that system has been by money, and there's a way to fix that, they'll listen to us. Mm -hmm. Okay, you gave me my next question. What's the way to fix that? <laughs> ah, the way to fix the money thing is public campaign financing. The oldest saying in politics is, you got to dance with them what brung you. And that used to mean that you voted with the people who elected you. you know, here's a bunch of people down in Texas who are all in favor of the Angora goat subsidy. I vote in favor of Angora goat subsidies. Um, what has happened now is that because of the way campaigns are financed, this enormous amount of corporate special interest money pours into the coffers of politicians, and when they get elected, that's who they vote with, often against the interests of their own constituents. When you are an elected official, how should you decide how to vote? It's a question that often comes up when right. I'm talking to politicians. Right. And the debate goes back and forth. Are you there to represent the people that mm -hmm. voted for you, or are you there to represent what you believe and that they're right. voting for you to bring your best judgment? Where's the um, answer? The general consensus is that you, most of the time you vote the way your constituents want you to. If you are having a serious scruple of conscience or your understanding of the problem is radically different from that of your voters, then you're being paid for your best judgment and you go with it. But those occasions are very rare. The trickiest thing in politics, people always think that it's going to be very simple. All, it, there aren't very many 60-40 decisions in politics. There are an awful lot of 51-49 decisions. And that's why they get paid. What's the most surprising thing you think that's come out of politics this past year? Hmm. The thing that got you just the most incensed? I really think that the administration pulled a giant beat and switch operation, and I've never seen one done more effectively. Suddenly, Osama bin Laden was gone, and there was Saddam Hussein, who had had nothing to do with 9-11. And you keep saying, how did that happen? When were we supposed to get Osama bin first? You know, that's a Texas thing. Lots of people think he has two front names, Osama bin, like Jerry Jeff and <laughs> Joe Bob. <laughs> Let's get Osama bin first. How are we going to rectify all of that? What do you think they're going to have to do to straighten all of what's going on in the rest of the world? Well, 
Let me tell you something. The, part of it looks on, is, depends on your attitude. I, for the purpose of this new book, Bushwhacked, my publisher wants me to mention the title, um, we went that, through every speech that George W. has made on foreign policy, both before and after September 11th. And what you get again and again, it's quite striking, is the language of fear. Uh, he talks about threats and enemies and dangers and evil as though the whole world were lurking out there, a dark, ugly thing waiting to come get us. He nowhere addresses the idea of, you know, here's what we need to do to make a better world. And here's how we can work with other countries to do it. And we could get together on this and solve this problem. We could get together here and solve that problem. No, it's always threat, danger, enemy. And there's something about the language of fear that makes people feel helpless. You know, they sit there and go, oh, dangerous world out there. Mm, this is bad. Mm. People get so scared that sometimes they hurt themselves. And we see that in this country, in, in the history of this country. People get so scared of some terrible menace of crime or drugs or communism or illegal aliens or terrorism that we think we can make ourselves safer by making ourselves less free. Let's give up some of our rights, then we'll be safer. Actually, when you make yourself less safe, less, less, less free, you're not safer, you're just less free. You know, and that's a wonderful story to tell, especially with the weather we have going on around us right now. It's like ending with a wonderful ghost story. Molly, thank you very much for joining us. All right, it was my pleasure.